Hello, art history students. Welcome back. Uh, for this little lecture, we're going to talk about the principles of design. So I may have mentioned this in the last video, but I'm going to say it again. Usually in the classroom setting, we do these on the same day. But the a normal class period is, is approximately an hour and a half long. And to make you guys watch an hour and a half long YouTube video seems seems excessive. So rather than clump it together by time frame, I want to clump it together by idea and what you need to know. So this one will be a little bit shorter um, than the elements, but it is no less important. So these are the principles of design. All right. So again, this first unit is very much so filled with uh, a lot of vocabulary terms and a lot that you are more than likely familiar with, but I want to make sure that you understand them in the context that we are talking about them. So the principles of design are sort of like the grammar or they're like the recipe that uses all of the elements that we talked about in the last lecture. Another vocabulary word I want you to know is composition. I'm going to use that term a lot in this class, so keep note of that. The first that we're going to talk about is emphasis. So emphasis is the like the title of the principle and then underneath of it are a couple other vocabulary words. So one is focal point. That is a big um, word that you're going to hear often and it's basically just the area in which you which your eye is drawn to. And then subordination is something that artists do very intentionally. It's complementary to emphasis, and we'll get to that in a moment. So if the focal point is the area in which your eye can cannot look away from, you, you almost have to kind of look at that area. What is the focal point of this artwork? Now I want to ask, why can your eye not look away from it? And think about all of those things that we talked about in the last lecture, about value and the line and proportion and scale and maybe color, right? So what is keeping your eye at that one location? So it is the directional lines are all sort of leading you to that one sort of gruesome area of the artwork. And then there's the contrast in value between the sort of foreground figures and the background. There is barely a background at all. It's just all blackness. The colors in the foreground are highly saturated and really brought forward. So this is um, an artwork, Judith Decapitating Holofernes. We will talk more about the storyline that is associated with this artwork when we come to the Baroque era. All right, next is balancing emphasis. In contrast to the last artwork that we saw where your eye was completely drawn to that one area and you almost couldn't look away from it, this artwork lacks a clear focal point. Your eye seems to bounce around between all of these individual figures. And Jacob Lawrence did this very intentionally. The point that he was trying to make was that, or by not having a clear focal point, by having this balanced emphasis, He's making the point that none of these individual soldiers is more or less important than than the one next to it. Um, they're all of equal. They have equal time with your eye, which means that they have equal sort of importance in the artwork. All right. So I want to ask you guys, what is the focal point of this artwork? What's the area that your eye just cannot seem to look away from? So the next thing I'm going to do is this artwork deals with a story, the fall of Icarus. And as I've said before, a lot of art history deals with storytelling or is sort of linked to storytelling. So we're going to have a storytelling moment with storytelling with Lacey. So this is the fall of Icarus. If you're not familiar with it, I'm going to give you the short version of the story. So Icarus and his father are imprisoned on an island. And there is nothing on the island except for the sort of dwelling that they are, are living in, their prison area, a bunch of geese and a bunch of beehives and I guess sticks and shrubs and stuff. So Icarus and his father obviously want to get off of this island. So Icarus's father is pretty, he's pretty industrious and he crafts these wings out of the geese feathers 
the sticks and shrubs, and then the beeswax. And him and his son Icarus go to the highest peak of their little island prison, and they're going to jump off and sort of fly back to the mainland. But Icarus's father says to him, you know, do not fly too low because the feathers will get wet from the mist from the ocean. And if they get wet, it'll weigh you down, you'll fall into the ocean, and you'll perish. Also, do not fly too high, do not fly too close to the sun, because the heat from the sun will melt the beeswax, and the same thing will happen. You'll fall to the ocean and perish. So, long story short, if you've ever heard the sort of saying, like, he flew too close to the sun, right? So, Icarus is so excited, he's over exuberant at his flying wing contraptions and he flies too close to the sun and ultimately falls into the ocean. So that is a dramatic moment of that story, right? It is sort of the pinnacle of the story is that moment when Icarus is falling. And that's the focal point of this artwork that kind of makes sense from a storytelling perspective. Now, when we talk about subordination, which is almost like the anti-emphasis. It, it deliberately draws attention away from a particular part of a composition. So this artwork has the same storyline. It is called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. Right? Can you even see Icarus? So I will point him out to you just in case you can. These are his little legs. Right in the ocean, right there, little tiny, tiny legs sticking out. Right, so this is kind of this is intentional by this artist that this mo this dramatic moment in the storyline is completely unknown by this plowman. Right, this you know this is obviously the the pinnacle of the story, and it made sense that it was the focal point in the other artwork. But by saying that. This insane story may be going on around you or behind you or just out of your peripheral vision. And if you don't, if you're not aware of it, you're just going to go on continuing your life as you did before, just like this little uh, plow man here in the foreground. So that is subordination. Subordination is almost always very intentional by the artist. Usually the focal point, the emphasis, whether it's balanced um, subordination, it's usually intentional by the artist and communicating something with you. All right, unity and variety. Um, these things should be, these are um, complementary ideas. They, they should be familiar terms to you. So what shape is unifying this work of art? It's squares, squares, cubes, right? You see them over and over and over again in different places throughout the composition. Scale and proportion. So scale and proportion sound similar, and they both have to do with size, but I want to make a clear difference between the two of them, just so you know. So scale is something in relation to normal size, right? So Claus Oldenburg's giant matchbook here is obviously way out of scale for its surroundings, right? It's enormous. Matchbooks are usually real tiny, right? You guys are all getting that. Proportion has to do with the size of parts of a whole, right? So if I had really enormous hands, they would be out of proportion for my body. They wouldn't be out of scale because scale is a whole object in relation to its environment, whereas proportion is parts of one object or one thing or one image, right? If you have any questions about this, email me. All right, rhythm and pattern. So pattern is something that you're familiar with and you're probably familiar with rhythm, but visual rhythm works a little bit differently um, <clears throat> than the rhythm term that you're used to. So this is pattern. We know that if we were to take this vase and turn it around to the other side, it's we know what's coming next, right? The other side looks exactly the same as this side that we see, right? It, pattern is very predictable. 
This is rhythm. So this is Chuck Close's self-portrait. And when you look at it from a distance, this artwork is actually very large. When you look at it from a distance, you kind of see the image of a man, right? This is, uh, this is self-portrait of Chuck Close. When you get a little bit closer and look at it in a little bit more detail, you can see the visual rhythm. And it's not exactly the same and it's not as predictable as pattern, right? So some of these sort of square diamond circle cells that you see that are gridded off, some are lighter and darker than others, some sort of merge together into rectangles and whatnot. And this is part of what creates the overall image. So this is rhythm and it's the big difference is it's not as clearly um, predictable. So visual rhythm is something different. Visual rhythm is what leads your eye through an artwork, right? It leads your eye from one place to another. It's kind of difficult to pick out visual rhythm because when it's done really well, it's like you don't even know that it's happening. Um, we'll see that at work. So this is Hunters in the Snow, and I want you guys to just take a second, take, take 10 seconds, and, and just look at this artwork. All right, now I'm going to, if I was a betting man, I would put money down that you all experienced this artwork in the same three sort of phases. First, your eye saw this, then they moved down to this area, then up these mountains, then eventually back, sort of dip back down those trees to those dogs and hunters in the snow, right? Everyone who looks at this sort of sees it in the same rhythm, right? And that's because the visual rhythm is done so well. So it's, visual rhythm happens really organically and it happens um, to almost all of us, it's sometimes difficult to pinpoint exactly what it is because when it's done well, it just happens. All right, so those are the principles of art. Um, here, if you have any questions about any of them, please don't hesitate to email me and don't forget to complete your discussion uh, post that is associated with the principles of art. So I will see you next time. We are going to talk about the types of analysis. It's the last and final lecture for this sort of basic, the basics unit that we're in right now. And then there will be um, a quiz on that. So thank you.